the Rubik's Cube. The premise is so remarkably simple, yet to get to that solved state, it's often considered incredibly difficult, or impossible. Almost 50 years ago now, a man named Erno Rubik invented this, and even he, the very man who invented it, had to learn how to solve his own puzzle, his own creation. Which is fair enough, because if you were to take a wild guess of how many combinations a Rubik's Cube has, how many ways you can mix it up, you probably aren't even touching the surface. It has, to be exact, 43 quintillion, 252 quadrillion, 3 trillion, 274 billion, 489 million, 856,000 combinations. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a big number, right? Um, but truly, this number is almost completely unfathomable and unquantifiable with the human mind. Get this, try to imagine every single star in our galaxy. And yeah, it's pretty hard to do already. <laughs> now times that by 250. Try to imagine every single second that's occurred since the estimated time of the Big Bang. Again, it's pretty hard to do when we weren't there. <laughs> now times that by a thousand. See, what I'm getting at is that, like I said, to a human mind, this number is pretty much infinite which is scary, right? Sometimes overwhelming. Due to this, we often go for the loopholes, right? Peeling the stickers off and putting them back on, taking it apart, putting it back together. I'm seeing some nods. <laughs> there was even a hoax that went viral years ago. You may have seen it. It stated that if you did just two moves over and over on the Rubik's Cube, that it would eventually solve. I'm sure you can conclude that this would not work. It wouldn't even affect two-thirds of the cube. But these poor, poor kids. Like, let's, let's, let's just look at the recent comments here. This is a scam. I made a fool of myself in front of my mates, due, in front of, sorry, mutates due to your shirts video. Please delete immediately or face legal action. <laughs> I did it so many times. This is fake. That's from the same person, by the way. And then, why not her? Quad your high work. I tried it for two hours. And finally, your pants are on fire. <laughs> See, I think the issue people have with the cube is how intimidating they think it is, which is why they're trying to find that easiest way out, that loophole. But today, I want to prove to you that the cube is not that scary, it's not that overwhelming, and it's very possible. And I want to prove that to you through my story, because I'm not a prodigy, I'm not remarkable. I just found a unique hobby that I loved, and it taught me more than I could ever have imagined. So this is me, eight years ago now. <laughs> In case you can't tell from the picture, I was an avid magician, I was 13 years old, and I loved magic. I did it at shows and gatherings, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But then I noticed that Rubik's Cube magic was becoming something of a trend in the magic community. So I decided to pick up a Rubik's Cube straight away and try and integrate it into my magic routines. And when I did, there was just something so fascinating about it. I'd always been intrigued by the cube, but now I was old enough to understand that this thing was actually solvable if I applied myself. So I dropped the idea of learning a trick, making it look like I could solve it, and actually truly learned to solve it. And when I did, there were a few things that instantly struck me. These little facts about the way the cube worked that suddenly made this scary puzzle make a lot more sense. So let, let, me, let me show you, we have a camera here. So here's a cube. <laughs> In the middle of each side, there is this middle piece, we call that the centerpiece, for obvious reasons, right, the centerpiece. No matter what, that will determine the color of each side. So no matter how much I mix it up, white is always opposite yellow, blue is always opposite green, red is always opposite to orange. They determine the color of each side. No matter how much I mix it up, those six pieces will always remain, remain solved. Another thing, one more thing. You'll notice that you don't solve it side by side. That's a common misconception. Once someone came up to me, they told me they managed to solve five sides and not the sixth side. I don't know how that's possible. You solve it layer by layer, row by row, right? So let, let, me, let, me, let me show you. So I'm going to do the first layer first, if I can. There's the first layer, right? And if you can show that to your friends, that's like a pretty much solved cube, right? And then you do second layer, like that. And then you finally do the third layer, like that. See? <laughs> and oh, thank you. <laughs> That's good, thanks. And then finally, another thing I learned. You don't need to be smart or academic to solve a cube. Solving a Rubik's Cube is a simple application of a skill that we all have by nature, muscle memory. If you can ride a bike, if you can write your name, if you can play a video game, you can solve a Rubik's Cube. And if you can't do any of those, I'll probably still give it a go, to be honest. So after a bit of research, I learned that you, to solve a Rubik's Cube, you need to learn these things called algorithms, which I was initially quite scared by, because it's a very mathematical word. I'm not a, math, I'm not a mathematical guy. But an algorithm, when applied to a Rubik's Cube, is simply just this. It's a set of moves that will temporarily mix it up and then put it back, having switched a few pieces. 
a set of moves that will temporarily mix it up and then put it back, having switched a few pieces. I like to imagine these algorithms as just five to ten chord piano songs, which you ingrain in your muscle memory. You don't, you don't need to think about it too much. Like I said, we all use muscle memory. Typing, cooking, gardening, whatever it may be. The only difference is recognizing that specific pattern on the cube of when to use that right algorithm. And to solve it, you only need to know about four or five algorithms, four or five songs, right? And you can do it. Nowadays, though, I know about a thousand algorithms, which means I can cut corners, right? I can be slightly more efficient. Nowadays, it takes about six seconds to solve the cube. Let me show you. There you go. <laughs> but that didn't happen overnight, did it? So in 2015, I learned those four algorithms to solve the Rubik's Cube. And when I did, I was instantly, entirely hooked. Um, it, it was weird, though, because obviously I was 13 years old at the time, so when everyone else was going home from school to play football or play video games, I was going home to play with a Rubik's Cube. Uh, which, I mean, as you can imagine, you can imagine how cool that made me. <laughs> Initially, people thought it was quite, in they were interested, right? They'd take their scrambled, ho their scrambled cube from home for me to solve for them. Probably could have made quite a successful business out of that <laughs> alone. Uh, but eventually, I think people were just confused. Well, I was pursuing this thing that was considered nothing more than a hobby. But I was obsessed, and after about six months, I went to my first Rubik's Cube competition. And see, when I tell people that I go to these Rubik's Cube competitions, I imagine they picture a bunch of nerds in a room going head-to-head, -head, seeing who can get the fastest time. In reality, they're only really right about it being a bunch of nerds in a room. <laughs> but see, when I went to my first Rubik's Cube competition, I was instantly, entirely engrossed. It's safe to say that this is a fairly solitary activity, right? Yet suddenly you're surrounded by all these like-minded people. Yet we have no nemeses, right? The only people we're going against are ourselves, trying to better our own personal times. There's this focus on being the best you can be, but never at the cost of another's failure. Never at the cost of another's failure. Honestly, I've never known of a community so accepting of others. Whether it's your ranking, age, race, gender, I can assure you there will be no judgment. In fact, competitions have quite a large neurodivergent demographic. And when I speak to these neurodivergent people, they've often told me that it's at a Rubik's competition that they feel the most content, the most safe, the most heard, the most themselves in a social environment. Take Max Park, for example. He's considered to be the fastest Rubik's Cube solver in the world, a time of 3.13 seconds to solve the cube. His parents got him into this because he's on the autistic spectrum, and they believed the cube might help with his motor skills, which it did. But coincidentally, it also made him able to socially communicate like never before. Now he goes around the world competing, doing what he loves as a job. And I think that's amazing. So it's quite ironic. I got obsessed with this truly solitary activity, yet it connected me to a group of individuals that I never knew existed a community of smart, ambitious people pushing themselves to be the best they could be, and undoubtedly pushing me to be the very best that I could be. So just over a year since I first solved the cube, I went to the UK Rubik's Cube Championships 2016. It's an annual event that crowns the UK champion, the ultimate accolade. Well, in the UK, of course, world champion would be ideal. But it was every year. And to be the UK champion, you need to have the fastest average solve time out of everyone in the final round. So you can win the first round, doesn't matter. You need to win the final round. So you need to make the final round as well. In 2016, I made the final. Lo and behold, I came last in the final, but I had a little experience. Um, but then I, it obviously motivated me massively to practice some more. So I came back the following year in 2017, and I came third. So I made the final, and I came third that time, and I was ecstatic, yet also inherently aware that I was only 0.3 seconds away from being the UK champion. That title, which uh, it was so prestigious, I was so excited to get. So I practiced some more, right? And in 2018, I, made, uh, I, I went to UK Championships once again, and that year I actually got four national records. So I definitely felt like I was in it to win it. I was ready to try and attain that title. And then I didn't even make the final. <laughs> so from third phase the previous year to not even making the final the next, it was quite a shock to the system, I must admit. And in retrospect, this is actually quite a significant moment, to be honest. Because it's a, fail it's a setback, isn't it? It's a failure, a mess up. But I never even considered treating it like that. Why? Because the very fundamentals of the Rubik's Cube teach you to take setbacks in your stride. Now, let, let me explain. I'm sure if any of you have tried to solve a Rubik's Cube or solve the Rubik's Cube, you may be able to relate. As soon as you've solved a chunk of the cube, a portion of the cube, you become hesitant to mess up what you've already made, right? Oh, I got those blues there. How do I get that blue there without messing up that blue? Do you know what I mean? Essentially, the instant you try to get anywhere with solving the Rubik's Cube, you have no choice 
but to accept this paradoxical rule that you'll have to mess up what you've already made to solve more. And like I said, an algorithm is a set of moves that will temporarily mix up the cube to switch a few pieces. So, so it's weird, you need to disarrange the cube to arrange the cube further. You need to accept disturbance to initiate resolution. You need to mess up to succeed, right? Isn't that quite powerful? The cube teaches you to destroy to discover, to destroy to discover. And I came out the following year in 2019 and I won it, by over half a second too. <laughs> and undoubtedly, the setback of 2018 made that win in 2019 all the more satisfying. And then I think we all know what happened in 2020, right? Uh, and initially, lockdown was a great excuse for me to practice for hours upon hours, but soon motivation dwindled because I couldn't see my friends, I couldn't compete. And anyway, that year I went to university uh, to study English, which everyone seems to be very surprised by, by the way, as if I need to be a mathematician to solve it. Yeah, I studied English, I loved it. Um, but then stuff started moving again, and I wanted to do a couple more things. And last year, I did something a bit different. I set the Guinness World Record, and I solved 6,931 Rubik's Cubes in the space of 24 hours breaking the previous record of 5,800. Oh, thank you again. <laughs> breaking the previous record of 5,800. Believe it or not, there was a previous record for that. And, uh, and I did it, and it was amazing. But I think this, again, emphasizes the power of the Rubik's Cube speed-solving community. Because everyone's always impressed by my, my, yeah, my, my fast-solving time, my ability to fight fatigue. But actually, the hardest part of that attempt was the logistics of having a 24-hour feed of scrambled cubes. And I didn't have 6,000 Rubik's, 7,000 Rubik's Cubes, I had six Rubik's Cubes. And they were being cycled around, thankfully, due to my amazing friends working in four-hour shifts, scrambling cubes that, I, that I'd solved constantly for hours, of, uh, hours on end. It was amazing. And, uh, and since then, I've had a bit of a revelation, because I really thought that the, the most gratification I'd ever get out of the cube would be to get these records, right, these accolades. Um, but as it turns out, after that world record, I did a TV interview that was subsequently put online. It garnered a couple million views. And there were comments on there from people saying that very video got them into solving Rubik's Cubes. That very video. I, I, I never set out to be a so-called influencer, but suddenly there were these people online, these random strangers that were being influenced in a positive way from something that I had done, which was amazing. And I really hope that these people, these people that have got into cubing, can find that amazing community, but also learn to destroy, to discover. But there's actually one more aspect which I haven't discussed yet, and I think it's often overlooked, and it's definitely relevant to the Max Park story too. Taking me to competitions, uh, putting up with that clicking. My mum, who's actually in the audience today. <laughs> um, <woo. laughs> if your child picks up a Rubik's Cube, you might get a bit worried. It's one chance at life, and they've chosen the most eccentric, unusual, nerdy hobby. <laughs> but my mum wasn't phased. She always told me to pursue whatever I liked in life and that if I liked it enough, it would help me grow, and undoubtedly this has helped me grow. And I think the question I get the most nowadays is, are these skills transferable? Um, and I think it's because we're obsessed with these, set, with these stepping stones in life, you know? Uh, you know, how can we utilize this hobby to get a conventional job? But I don't think it should matter whether these skills are transferable or not. I doubt I'll be pursuing the Rubik's Cube for my entire life, although I do like the idea of me being, you know, 80 years old, still competing. <laughs> But if there's one thing I've taken away from the cube, and one thing that I want you to take away from this talk today, it's this. Give people the security to explore unconventional paths in life. Because you'll be so surprised by the hidden lessons that come with pursuing something you're truly passionate about. I can't emphasize enough how transformative being connected to this community has been for me. And it's all because my mum let me chase my nerdy dream of solving a Rubik's Cube as fast as I could at the age of 13. Thank you.